Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here, especially since we added the topic to the meetup about 48 hours ago. Your trust is much appreciated. <laughs> uh, my name is Miro Tsupak. I'm with a company called DNA Stack, where we're building a cloud platform for search, access, and analysis of biomedical data. We are hiring, so if you want to work on cool things uh, that make a difference, please come talk to me after the talk. Or, or just come by and say hi if you're interested in health tech in general. Uh, because this talk is not focusing on the domain, it's focusing on the underlying technology stack, which of course is Java, and more specifically, local variable type inference. Now, I like learning for examples, and I'm going to write many of them throughout this talk, and I'm going to write all the examples in JShell, which is Java's implementation of a REPL that we've had since version nine. If you haven't seen JShell before, don't worry about it too much. Uh, it's pretty easy to figure out, as a tool like this should be. And if you have used the REPL in a different technology stack, it's basically the same thing. So I think that's enough for slides. Let's just jump straight to the code, and I'll just switch to my terminal here. So what you're seeing here is JShell. I'm actually running JShell from uh, OpenJDK 13, because what could possibly go wrong, live coding on an early access build of the JDK. Um, JDK 13, as we said, is, of course, as of recently, in ramp down phase one, which basically means that it's feature complete, but still open to bug fixes and uh, small enhancements and it goes to in September, so a relatively early preview of things that we have here. Anyway, let's talk about local variable type inference. Local variable type inference is probably the most visible and impactful language feature that we got in Java uh, in recent years, because it affects every developer, right? And as is typical with Java features, this is not a new revolutionary concept, right? Java tends to be fairly conservative when it comes to adoption of new things. So if you worked with a different programming language like Scala or C Sharp, they have all had that for a while. And starting with Java 10 and then enhanced in Java 11, we have local variable type inference in Java as well. Java actually has a fairly limited form of local variable type inference. Essentially what it does is whenever you have a declaration of the variable, it looks on the right side on the type of its initializer expression, and it infers on the, the type of the left based on this initializer. And that's really all there is to it. So what that means in practice is that you can declare variables using the var keyword. It's actually not a keyword. It's something called a reserve type name, and we'll see why that matters a little bit later. So this is what it looks like. I can just create a variable. Let's call it x and make it a string. And you can see that this worked just fine. And if we take a look, at this variable, you can see that it's correctly stored and inferred as a string, right? So this is an important thing to note here. This is not like bar in JavaScript. We're not sacrificing static typing in any way. We're just inferring based on the surrounding context. This is a string, and it will always be a string. So if you're seeing it for the first time, you might be thinking, this seems a little bit sketchy, right? There might be some case of polymorphism that I can construct that would allow me to create some weird thing that doesn't infer correctly. And that's kind of true, which is why there's a very specific set of rules in place for when we're allowed to use this. So let's try to explore these together. Now, disclaimer, I've been working with Java for quite a while, probably around a decade or so, but I'm certainly not an expert on type system. Uh, the type system has always been just a tool that was available to me as a developer, and I used it, but I never really tried to think about it systematically or pick it apart. Uh, and that's kind of how this talk came together. I was when Java 10 came out, I was reading the chaps to see what's new. I was reading the chap for the local variable type inference, and I realized that my understanding of the type system is not good enough to understand all the things that were listed there. More specifically, the chap lists a couple of limitations, uh, about a handful or so, uh, basically situations when local variable type inference doesn't work. And it wasn't clear to me if this is some sort of an inherent limitation of the compiler, or if it's a design decision, and if so, why? So I've been playing around with this for a while, and I came up with this list of 40 examples that I think are interesting. So they show different aspects and different contexts for local variable type inference, uh, situations when it works, when it doesn't work, or when it works but creates some sort of unclean code. But if at any point in the talk uh, you think that I'm not saying something correctly or you have something to add, please do so. I also want to learn things. So let's take a look at these. and. Uh, as you've maybe seen in the description of this talk, the whole talk is basically a pub quiz. So it relies on your participation. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you through these 40 code examples, basically very simple one-liners. And for each one of them, I'm going to ask you a simple yes-no question. Most often, this question is going to be, will this compile? 
And I will ask you to raise your hand if you think the answer is yes, and then raise your hand if you think the answer is no. And what I'm curious about is how well you do as a group, as a sample population of Java developers. So besides raising your hand for when you think the answer is right, I will ask you to do another thing, and that is to count the number of questions that you get right, or write them down somewhere in your phone, because at the end, we can then do a final poll, and you can see how well you do compared to other people in the room. In fact, I, th I think I'm willing to put this on the line. I will buy a beer to the person who gets the highest score. So high stakes, OK? <laughs> OK, everybody clear on the rules? Everybody good to go? OK. So let's start with the first example, which is generics. So diving right in. So let me create a simple list here. And let's make it an array list. And let's give it some type. Let's say an array list of string. And the first question, of course, is will this compile? So who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, pretty, pretty overwhelming yes. And yeah, it, it is correct. This was a warm-up example. This does compile. In fact, this is kind of exactly what the feature was designed for. They specifically mentioned this case uh, in the chat. So when you're dealing with generics, the types can get pretty complex and hard to read. Um, and this feature helps a lot with that. Just imagine a very simple example. You can have a map of objects to some list of other objects or something like that. It's already pretty hard to read. So this works. And if we take a look at this list, you can see that it's correctly inferred as an array list of string. Now, one thing to note here, this is not how we would normally write this, right? If I was writing this from scratch, I would make this a list, like the interface. I wouldn't make this an array list. But that's not how type inference works. Type inference always infers the most specific type. So it's just something to keep in mind. Don't just you know, upgrade to Java 10 and automatically refactor everything to use var, because it can potentially break your code. Like If I was relying on this being a list, and later on I assign a different implementation on a list of a list into the same variable, this would stop working now. So yeah, just something to keep in mind. It shouldn't actually affect you too much, because local variable type inference was designed for variables with very limited scope. So it's actually quite unlikely that we would reassign into the same variable in such a small context. Question number two, declarations without explicit initialization. So this, of course, is valid Java code. Now, the question is, will this compile? Who thinks it will? Who thinks it will not? OK, everybody thinks it doesn't, and you are correct. This does not compile. And yeah, uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's basically worth noting that this is a design decision, right? Like, we could infer this. The compiler sees all of our source code, so it could do more sophisticated analysis, look further, yeah, look further, further down, see what kind of type I decide to assign it later on, and actually infer it correctly. It was just a design decision that we're not doing that to sort of avoid these action at the distance uh, inference errors. OK, so it doesn't work without initializer. How about I initialize it, but initialize it to null? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 80-20 uh, for no. And yeah, you're right. This doesn't work either. And it kind of makes sense, right? It's, it's similar to the example that we had before. Uh, I, think it's worth, I think it's worth noting here that there are a few options that we had here, right? There are a few things that we could infer. So we've already discarded inferring the exact type. That was, that was the previous case. But there are other options, right? We could, for example, infer null type. Null type is a, is a very special type in Java in that it's a subtype of every reference type. And it's also very special because it has only one value, and that value is null. So we could infer this. But it wouldn't be very useful, right? I could never assign anything to that variable because null is the only value. So that's not very practical. So let's discard that option as well. Then I could go the opposite way, right? I could try to infer the most general thing. So I could infer this as an object. And this also would work, but would not be very practical. Because if I'm expecting this to be, for example, a string, and I assign a string to it later on, I would expect to be able to run normal string methods on it. But that wouldn't be the case, right? I would have to cast it everywhere. So that's, that's not very practical either. So we've run out of options, which is why we're not allowing this. So OK, doesn't work with null. Uh, well, how about I keep it a null, but tell it explicitly that I mean this to be an integer null? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 for yes. 
and it does. So it really was just a matter of not knowing the type on that specific line. If I tell it that this is an integer, everything is fine. OK, let's take a look at compound declarations. So in Java, of course, I can declare multiple variables on the same line, right? I can do uh, something like this. Now the question is, if I replace this with var, will this work? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 50-50. Yeah, this actually doesn't compile. And it's just not allowed there. Basically, to avoid confusion, they decided this was too confusing. And also, they didn't want to encourage this pattern anyway. So it's just not allowed. So let's take a look at methods now. How about I create a method here. Uh, let's do something like this. Let's call this method increment. and the method takes a variable and just increments it by one. Of course, this is valid Java code. Now let's try to use var in place of the argument of the method. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, 100% no. And you guys are correct. Var is not allowed there. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like here, we're dealing with overloading. So you basically don't want to rely on the type inference there. All right, so it doesn't work with arguments. How about return values? How about I do this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this would not compile? OK, probably 90-10 uh, for no. And yeah, does not compile, not allowed there either. So basically, you can use it in method signatures. All right, question eight, uh, for loops. How about I create a for loop? Uh, like this. Let's just give it a variable. Uh, let's say less than 100. Let's keep it empty. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 for yes. Yep, it does compile. And again, this is actually a really good use case for using var and something that I specifically mentioned in the chat as like a use case that they were trying to solve. So for loops. Definitely does work there. How about for each then? How about I do something like this? Uh, how about this? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, again, probably 80 20 uh, for yes. And it does work. Yeah, uh, for each as well as for, again, something the feature was designed for, mentioned in the chat, it just simply works. Great. So question 10, primitive values, primitive types. Uh, of course, something like this uh, is valid Java code. Now how about uh, I replace this with var? Who thinks this will work? Who what do you mean by work? Compiles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who thinks this will not compile? OK, o overwhelming yes. And it does compile. But as was clear from the question, as many of you suspected, this might not infer to what you originally expected, right? This infers as an int. So it's just something to keep in mind. There are several primitive types that all infer as an int, like short, long, byte, that sort of thing. So how about I try some hexadecimal or binary numbers? How about I do something like this? Uh, so the question here is, well, I'm not going to ask if this compiles. I'm just going to tell you that it does. The question is, what does this infer as? So we have yeah, a couple of options. Who thinks it's an integer? Who, who thinks it's an object? Who thinks it's something else? OK, pretty overwhelming vote for integer, a couple of votes for some other options as well. It is an integer. So this is all fine. But the example that I was trying to build up to is actually doing something like this. I'm going to add an extra digit. And what's happening here is that now I made this integer too big. Now it's over 32 bits. So the question is, will this automatically infer as a long, or will this fail to compile? Who thinks it will automatically infer as a long? Who thinks it will not compile? OK, probably 50-50 split. Yeah, does not compile. So this is too large. It's not smart to that extent. 
it just always defaults to an integer, which kind of makes sense, right? Because this value could be supplied at runtime. So you really, it's not that much that you could do there. Of course, if I told it explicitly that this is a long, it's still fine, right? Yeah, this, yeah. What okay. I, I have a question. Yeah? What if you wrote long x equals that literal with every other hand? That will also fail to compile. Like this? Okay. Integer yeah. or well, numbers are always. Yeah, it's going to plug the answer. No. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. So it's, oh. it's a problem. Yeah, literals are, you have to yes. Yes. yes, exactly. So actually, uh, sorry, just one more question. If you just write that literal value on its own, nothing else, mm -hmm. it's in that syntax. I don't know about it in JSON. Yeah, I couldn't even parse it to say that you can't put a number on its own. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just always an end. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. <laughs> Okay, so we've seen a bunch of things. We've seen methods. How about we try it with classes? How about I create a class here? Uh, let's call it my class. And I'll just create an attribute, uh, initialize it correctly, something like this. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? Okay, probably 90-10 split for no. And yeah, you are correct, and it tells you var is not allowed there. It's, yeah, it's not allowed at meta, in methods, it's not allowed at the class level. It's basically meant for variables with very limited scope. So it's just a design decision that it's not uh, allowed there. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It, it does actually automatically catch exceptions, even check exceptions for, for prototyping. Okay, so we've seen a bunch of situations here. Uh, now, an obvious question to ask is uh, about naming, right? We now have this new identifier in the code, which is var. We didn't have that before. So what happens if I, for example, try to name a variable var? <laughs> Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? Okay, I would say probably 60-40 for no, but it does actually compile. So this is completely fine. And this relates to what I mentioned at, at the beginning, that this is not a keyword, this is a reserved type name. If this was a keyword, this would not work, right? But because it's a reserved type name, this is just fine. Yeah, if, if I take a look at this variable, it's just a regular integer. But you can't create a class called var. Well, let's try that. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> let, let Actually, that's, that's jumping by two questions. The question that I had before that <laughs> is creating a method called var. Uh, who, who thinks this will compile? Uh, no. I say, wow. Oh, yeah, that, that actually won't, yeah. <laughs> that won't compile, but for a different reason that I attended. How about something like this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? Okay, o overwhelming yes, and yeah, you'll learn your lesson. This is you know similar to uh, to variables. It, we can completely do that. So now the question: How about we call a class var? How about something like this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? Okay, probably seventy thirty for now. And yeah, indeed, this does not compile, and it tells you that this is a breaking change as of release ten. Var is now restricted, and you cannot use it. So it is a breaking change, but you know, in all fairness, if you name your class var, you're already breaking so many naming conventions. That's probably a case sufficiently rare for us to be okay with this. That's a very good question. In fact, it's my very next question in the quiz. <laughs> So the question is, essentially, is Java case sensitive, right? That's what <laughs> this comes down to. Who, who thinks it is? Yeah, sure. Wait. yeah w w will this compile now? Sure. Who thinks this will not compile? OK. P pretty overwhelming, yes. Some people are still, still skeptical. And yeah, this, this fixes the problem. So yeah, <laughs> of course. That's actually probably what people used anyway. Yes. 
it's, it's, it would be very unusual to have a class with a lowercase start. So yeah, th this works. It is a terrible name for a class, so please don't use it, but it does work. So, so finally, on, on this sort of train of thought, the one thing that we haven't tried is uh, enums, right? How about I create an enum, and I'm going to use var as like an identifier in my enum, something like this. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably a 50-50 split. But yeah, it does. And yeah, it's, it's just the same case as a variable. This is, this is completely fine. Yeah? It's because you have to have the enum constants at the top, so it won't be confusing. Yeah, my enum. Yes, yes, we're using it inside an enum, not as, as the name for the enum, yes. So var is only an instance of my enum. Correct, yes. Yes. Okay, so 18 questions so far. Question 19. So one thing that we haven't tried so, so far are arrays, right? So how about... I use the var in place of an element of an array, right? So let's try to write the correct statement first. I can create an uh, array of integers, and let's maybe do something like this. This, of course, is valid Java code. So now let's try to replace this with var. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 60-40 split for no. And indeed, this does not compile. And it specifically tells you var is not allowed as an element type of an array. OK, fair enough. Not allowed as an element type. How about I use it as the type of the whole array? How about I do this? Who thinks this will compile now? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 split for yes. But in fact, this does not compile either. And it gives you an interesting error message. It tells you array initializer needs an explicit target type. Um, so basically, basically, what this comes down to is uh, when we look at this array, we don't know what type of an array this is, right? Like this could be shorts, this could be bytes, this could be ints. So there's already a type inference in place for arrays, right? Like the right side is trying to infer from the left side. But now we've added type inference on the left side. So the left side is trying to infer from the right side. And to sort of break this apart, we're basically not going to allow this cycle. So that's why this doesn't work. So yeah, it doesn't work. It needs an explicit target type. So how about I try to give it the explicit target type? How about I do something like this? Who thinks this will compile now? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, overwhelming yes. And you are correct, this fixes the problem. So the issue was really just you know, not having that type there. If we specify the type explicitly, everything is just fine. OK, so we're done with arrays now. Uh, how about try and catch? Let's create a very simple try block here. And I'm going to use local variable type inference there, correctly initialize and everything. Then let's try to catch some exception and Let's do it like this. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 split for yes. And yeah, it does compile. This was, you know, it's just a, a normal local variable. It's properly initialized and everything. It's just a block of code. There's nothing, nothing fancy happening here that would prevent it from working. So let's try to remove that from try. And let's try to use it in place of an exception here. Let's do something like this. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, everybody agrees this will not compile. And yes, you are right. Var is not allowed there, which makes sense, right? We're dealing with error handling. Error handling, of course, is important. You don't want to rely on type inference there, especially since all exceptions inherit from the same super type. So this is probably the safe way to go. All right, so let's try and catch. Let's try some newer features. So let's try lambdas. So let me just create a very simple lambda here. I'm going to create a supplier. Uh, and let's 
let's just do a very simple supplier, something like this, which of course is a valid lambda. Now let's try to use var here. Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will? Okay, who thinks this will not work? Okay, I'm gonna estimate it at 70 30 split for no. And yes, this does not work. Uh, and it tells you a very familiar error message at this point. Lambda expression needs an explicit target type, which uh, should be familiar, right? We've seen this with arrays, and that's basically what's going on here. So it's kind of the similar case that we had with arrays. Uh, lambda, exp lambda expressions need an explicit target type. There's already type inference going on from the right side to the left side. Now we're adding the other one, so to break this apart, we're not going to allow this. Okay, so it doesn't work with lambdas as a whole. How about I try it with parameters in lambdas? So let me just create a consumer here, and let's use uh, a parameter here. Very simple consumer, let's just print it out. Uh, something like this. Who thinks this will compile? Who? Okay, who thinks this will not compile? I'm running Java 13. Okay, probably 70 30 split. And yeah, this, this does compile. And what your colleague mentioned right now is exactly the correct observation. This is, it, it, it might seem like, yeah, of course this compiles, but it's actually, it depends on your version of Java. So in Java 10, this would not compile. With Java 11 and onwards, it does compile. In other words, this was a new feature. It was an extension to local variable type inference added in Java 11 uh, that decided that it makes sense to use this for lambda parameters as well. And it, it does kind of make sense, right, for consistency. We could already use it for all the local variables, so why not here? The, the reason for this is actually quite interesting. What they specifically list in the chat is that they wanted to allow this so that we can use uh, modifiers for lambda parameters, such as annotations. I find this interesting because I don't think I've ever been in a situation when I wanted to put an annotation on a lambda parameter. But I, so I think the argument for consistency and maybe like simplifying the grammar of the language is, is possibly more valid. But maybe that's just me. Maybe time will tell whether this is actually a useful feature. But what is the type of x? If you, if you slash v for c, what is the type? Yeah, so the thing with lambdas is right that we don't we can just use implicit types, right? So this works as well. So, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So this is a uh, function one when it's got a lot of function one. Yeah, can you slash function one yeah. on what? Sorry? Slash me well, for C. Oh, you're looking for C, okay. Yeah. Java still allows it's just, uh, a non type non generified plus consumer. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Which I call okay. of something in, right. in Java. Right. What, what do you want me to call? And it, it's type of the object. Yeah, something. Like to string? Yes, consumer is a raw type, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's probably object. You can, you can make them. If you print x dot get class, you can probably see object. No, you're going to get whatever instance of x you have. You're going to get the runtime class of the thing you passed in. Yes. But you'll you be can, able, you, you can create a new object and pass it in. You can try calling the method on consumer, passing in a new object, and seeing if that compiles. So c dot whatever method. Yes, we could do that. Let's do it after. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> this is going to take some time. <laughs> okay. So yes, it does work with with uh, parameters in lambdas, right? But how about I make this lambda a little bit more complex? Uh, let me. Well, that's actually not good. Let me find the correct one. Okay. Let me make this a by consumer. And let's add another parameter here, something like this. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 70-30 for yes. I was really just testing you. This is exactly the same as previous case. There's no reason for this not to compile. We just have more variables. But what I was building up towards 
is actually what happens if we mix implicit and explicit types with lambdas. So in other words, if I do this, what happens now? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 60-40 for now. And yeah, you are correct. And it tells you specifically, you cannot mix var with implicitly typed parameters. OK. OK, fair enough. Cannot mix with implicitly typed parameters. How about I mix it with explicitly typed parameters then? How about I do this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 for yes, but no. <laughs> and it tells, you, it tells you you cannot mix var with explicitly typed parameters either. So unfortunately, it doesn't work. <laughs> yes. Yes. So now, ju just to, just to wrap up this, uh, how about we try method references for completion? So let me just re rewrite my consumer here. I'm just going to uh, make it a method reference, uh, something like this, which is valid Java code. How about I do this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90, 10 for no. And it does not compile. Because it's basically the same as lambdas, right? It didn't compile with lambdas. Meta references are just lambdas. So th there's no reason for this to work. All right. So question three. How are we doing so far? Sorry? 30. 30. 30, yeah. We have a few more to go, yeah. At this point, I'm going to turn off the heat. In addition to the beer that Miro has pledged, we have a, an IntelliJ Ultimate beer subscription that we can give out. OK. So try harder for the next 10. Fear, things are getting real now. IntelliJ <laughs> for a year. All right. The examples are also getting real now. So let's see. So question 30. We've seen a bunch of things with uh, with generics, right? So let me just find my list from before. This was it. So th this worked just fine. How about I remove this type altogether? How about I just use the diamond operator? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK, probably 90-10 for no. Well, look at that. <laughs> this does actually compile. And, and let's take. Let's take a look at the type, and the type is an array list of an object. So, so this is interesting, right? This for me, this for me was probably the most surprising example out of all of, the, out of, all of them, uh, because you know if you think about the rules that we've seen before. They clearly put them in place to prevent us from creating things that would not be useful to us, right? But this is certainly not useful, right? An array list of object is almost never what you want. So why would they allow this? And I, I don't have a great answer for this, but I, I think the reason is consistency. Because the diamond operator in Java precedes local variable type inference, right? It was added in an earlier version of Java. And the way the diamond operator works, we already had situations when we could end up with an object, right? The diamond can use the target type. But, or the types of the constructor. And if neither is present, it falls back to the broadest applicable type, which usually is object. So now, after they add a local variable type inference for consistency, they had to keep telling the same story, right? It has to keep working the same way. So they just made it work the same way. So maybe, and that's completely a guess on my part, if these two things were added to Java in the same version, maybe this would be behaving differently. Maybe this would not be allowed. But as it is right now, this is allowed. They somehow can't infer a type from a static initializer. Yep. <laughs> if, you, if you don't use a diamond there, it's a That's a very good question. And it is my last question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so how about I remove this diamond altogether? How about I do it like this? Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? 
OK. Probably 90, 90 10 splits for yes. And it does compile. And if we take a look at this list, it, it's just an array. It's just a raw type. In fact, we've kind of seen it before, right, with consumers and by consumers. So it, it's not too surprising. There's one more example that I want to explore here, going back to this diamond example. So this, this inferred as an array list of object, right? It worked, but inferred as an array list of object. My question is, can I fix it by pre-initializing this list? In other words, if I give it an integer, I'm not, I'm not going to ask if this compiles. This does compile. But my question is, will it now correctly infer as an array list of integer? Or will it still be an array list of object? In other words, is the type inference smart enough to look inside the arguments of the constructor? No. So who thinks this will now infer as an array list of integer? Who thinks this will still be an array list of object? OK. Probably 80-20 for object. Let's take a look at it. And it's an integer. So it, it, it is sophisticated to that extent. It can do this kind of thing. Does the diamond infer from inside the constructor, or is it the bar infers from inside the constructor? <laughs> That, that, yeah. That's actually a good question, yeah. It's actually, it should be the diamond. So if we do this and take a look, it's still an array list of integer. Right. Yeah, so it just looks like the diamond. Yes, it is the diamond, yeah. OK, question 33. Uh, yeah? Would it be like an array list of object? It should be a raw type. It's a raw type. Yeah, it's a raw type. Like this? It's just a warning. Yeah, it's just a raw type. Thank you. OK, ready? OK, question 33. Um, capture variables and types with nested capture variables. This is hard when they're explicit. Yes. So, Maybe you haven't heard the term uh, capture variables before, but you've most likely seen it in action. Uh, a good example of this are wildcards, for example, when we have collections of unknowns. So let's try to create something like this. Now let me start by creating a list. Let's call it list one, because I'm going to need two. And let's just create a list of integer here. This is a normal list. Let's just check. You know, just a list of integer. Nothing sneaky happening here so far. So now let's try to extract the element of this list. Let's do something like this. And we have x. Taking a look at x, of course, it's an integer. Again, nothing sneaky happening here. But now let's try to create a list of unknowns. Uh, let's call it list 2. And I'm going to initialize it with the elements from my first list, right? So if we take a look at this, at this list 2, you will probably not be surprised to see that it's exactly what I told it to be. It's just a list of unknowns. But it has elements right now. So now, let's try to do the same thing. Let's try to extract the variable from this list, uh, just like this. So far, so good. And let's do another thing here. Let's try to add it back to this list. Now the question is, will this work? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 70-30 split for no. And yeah, this doesn't work. And it tells you that basically object cannot be converted to a capture. And the, the, the reason why this is not happening lies in the type of the variable x of the extracted element. right? If we take a look at this, it's an object. So from a list of unknowns, we got an object. And then in the next step, when I try to get an object, to insert an object to a list of something potentially more specific than an object, of course that didn't work, right? So here's the trick. So there's basically a specific rule uh, for capture variables. And that rule is that capture variables are projected to their supertypes that do not mention capture variables. So in other words, capture variables are replaced with their upper bounds and type arguments mentioning capture variables with bounded wildcards. And that's sort of done recursively, so you can like nest it and stuff. So that's a rule for capture variables here. OK, question 34, anonymous classes. So one thing that's known about Java and 
probably most of you have hit this at some point, is that a decision was made not to have an implementation of a tuple or a pair, right? So let's create a simple one here for demonstration purposes. So I can just call a variable x, and a very simple way of creating a tuple is just by using an object here, and I'm going to add a couple of attributes. Let's say attribute A, uh, attribute B, maybe something like this. Uh, which, of course, works just fine. This is just a normal anonymous class. Now, the question is, can I actually access this attribute? So who thinks I am able to access the attribute and this will work? Who thinks this will not work? Okay, probably 50-50 split. Yeah, this does work and uh, it's fine. Not a big deal, right? Well, it it's actually kind of is a big deal. Um, because this is a very simple implementation of a tuple, but I bet you've never seen this kind of construct in actual code. And the reason you've never seen it before is because this wouldn't work prior to Java 10, right? And why wouldn't this work? Well, let's take a look at this X that we inferred here. And you can see that it's something really weird. It's an anonymous class extending an object, right? This isn't something that I can declare directly, right? So anonymous classes, like capture variables, belong to so-called non-denotable types which are types supported by the compiler, but they're not typically exposed to users. But we can still use them, and local variable type inference brings that to us. So what would happen if I was you know, prior to Java 10? Well, on this line, where I'm creating an instance, I would have to give it a name, right? But this is an anonymous class. So the only option that I have here is to make it an object. And then if I try to access this attribute, of course this doesn't work, because this is just an object, and an object doesn't have an attribute called A, right? But with local variable type inference, I was able to infer something slightly more specific than an object that knows of these extra attributes. So it's kind of a really cool property to take advantage of. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for like readability purposes. Basically, if somebody was trying to understand your code, they have to be aware of this particular trick because otherwise this wouldn't make sense, right? So probably still not the best idea to use it in practice, but it is a cool thing and it does work. And it shows that local variable type inference is not just about creating syntactic shortcuts. It can actually like really deeply change semantics of your program. How about assigning Sorry? I do actually have a kind of a similar example here. It's going to demonstrate the same thing. And that's my next question, which is about intersection types. So intersection types, again, possibly the same scenario that you've seen with capture variables. If you haven't heard of them before, you may still see, see them in practice. And it's basically the, the types that extend from multiple things. So I can have something like this, t extends, so let's say number uh, and comparable, right? So Let's create a method that actually returns this. I'm going to call it make intersection type. And I'm going to keep it really simple. I'm just going to return null. OK? So what I have here is a method that takes null and casts it to, to my made up type, made up intersection type that I have here. Now the question is, if I try to combine this with local variable type inference, will this work? Who thinks this will work? Who thinks this will not work? OK, probably 50-50 split. And yeah, it does work. And if I take a look at this type, you can see that it's exactly what I told it to be. So this is kind of the same example that we had with anonymous classes, right? This is also a non-denotable type. But with local variable type inference, we're able to get access to it. So if I have another one, Let's say number n. Can I assign x into? Is that one? Like. So we use type the type number n equal x to that. Yeah. So number is a, is a super type of so this thing more specific than a number, right? Yeah. So. Uh, what? What did I do wrong? <laughs> no, it's because the intersection type isn't a runtime type. It's only a compiler type. So the runtime type is going to be the thing that is actually the base class that implements both of those. You should still be able to assign uh, whatever that class is, some type of number. Right? Because it implements the number. Or it has to. Hmm. 
Interesting, yeah. Th this seems very interesting, yeah. What about number the number whatever foo equals n? Sorry. Do you do like num number n equals n now? Now. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, because it's null. Yeah, so th this is something strange. So, so let's make, uh, make in the section had return, let's say, 5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. it call. Yeah. Yeah. Try. Try doing the same thing, but choosing a new name. Yeah. Using 5 instead of 5. Yeah. How about, how about left as an exercise to the reader so just so he can get through the end of his, his talk, otherwise you can get uh, run out of time. Okay, fair enough. Four more questions left. Okay, let, let's move on. So the, the final four questions that I have are essentially all about switch expressions. So switch expressions are a new feature in Java 12. Uh, it's actually not even a full feature, it's something called a preview feature. Um, which basically means that the feature is implemented, but it may not be, not be permanent. So you can try it out, but there's no requirements on backward compatibility. Uh, in other words, preview features are to language and VM features, what incubator modules are to APIs, right? So it's like a staging environment for language features. Uh, don't worry, they're not available by default, but if you pass a special flag to the compiler and the launcher, you can get access to them. So we can actually see that flag here. If we take a look at JShell, it's just enable preview. So switch expressions are essentially an extension of the switch statement that make it work also as an expression, okay? So this also solves two slightly annoying aspects uh, of switch. The default scoping of switch blocks, the fact that the block is treated as a single scope, and the default control flow behavior, so the thing that, you have, that it sort of falls through and you have to use breaks. This is basically done by introducing switch labels that kind of resemble lambdas. So if I create a new variable to switch on here, I can write a switch expression here on x and let's make a couple of cases let's say if this is zero return zero uh, otherwise return one so sort of a simple boolean uh, emulator if you will and you can see a couple of interesting things here right first of all uh, the the value of this is actually zero right so it is the value from the first arm without using any breaks or anything like that. Second of all, we're only using expressions inside. Uh, and finally, this whole thing is an expression, right? It has a return value. So a few interesting things here. There's also a convenience aspect to it. Obviously, the syntax is very concise and very easy to read. But we can even do things like aggregate multiple cases. So we can do something like this, which is also kind of nice. And since the whole thing is an expression, how about we assign it to a variable with some type inference, right? How about I do something like this? Actually, I'm already using X, so I'm going to do this. Who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? Okay, probably 90-10 for yes. And it does compile. So uh, this is fine. If we take a, a look at this, you can see that it is correctly inferred as an integer. So the, the compiler was able to look at what uh, these branches return and extrapolate from that. But this is interesting, isn't it, right? Because this isn't like the situation that we have with methods where I'm committing to a specific return type. I've never said that I'm going to return a consistent type in all my branches. So how would the compiler deal with me doing something like this? How about I return an integer in one branch but return a string in a different branch? So who thinks this will compile? Who thinks this will not compile? OK. So yeah, I would say maybe 60-40 for will compile. And it does indeed. So now it does compile. And you can see that it returns 0. But the obvious question is, what does this infer as, right? What is the type of y? So, so let's think about it for a second, right? What, what are our options here? So option number one, the compiler uh, is able to do some analysis. It's able to figure out what branch we're going to end up in. And it correctly infers this as an integer, right? Option number two, 
it sees that we have an integer and a string, so it tries to compute the, the parent of those two types, and it comes up with an object. Option number three, it comes up with something else completely different. So who thinks it's option number one? Who thinks this will be an integer? OK, one vote. Who thinks it's option number two? Who thinks this will be an object? So you ask me if I type y, get, get class, <laughs> <laughs> slash y, slash v y. Slash v y, slash v -Y. yeah. Okay. OK, so OK, good few votes for object. Who thinks it's something else? OK, so object is the winning, winning scenario here uh, by a mile. However, if we take a look at y, it's something else. <laughs> and it, it, it's, something, it's something long and something hard to read, especially in this small terminal. So what is happening here? So the compiler, first of all, let's discard the first option, right? The compiler could not infer an integer. Uh, because that could possibly, x could be a runtime past value, so there's no way we can infer this as a, at a compile time, right? Otherwise, all the other branches would be essentially dead code. So this would not work. The compiler actually did go the second route. It did try to infer the common supertype uh, of integer and string. But because we're not restricted to, de to uh, denotable types here, it was able to find something more specific than an object, these two things have in common, right? So this is actually hard to read, but it's an intersection type consisting of four types. And it is hard to read because a bunch of them are parametrized. But what we have here is serializable, we have comparable, we have constable, and we have constant, constant desk. And if you're thinking, well, the first two kind of make sense, but I've never heard of the other two, uh, that's completely fine. The other two are actually part of the JVM constants API, which is something that was added in Java, 11, Java 12. So if you haven't heard of this, it's just because it's a new feature. Did they also add like, captain, lieutenant? No, but they did, <laughs> add, they did add constable twice. That's true. No, it's a pyramid of. Yeah, it's, it's only one as a type. Otherwise, it's a parameter. But it's, it's as a parameter. Yes. OK. That's a very long. Uh, that, that is a very long type. Uh, yes? What if right now it's just going to be y equal to code? Sorry? Uh, like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like the first type is an object. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it is object. Right? I mean, that's true. Uh, it would be helpful if it was more specific in its end, but it is an object, yes. <laughs> I'm now interested about y equals empty, y equal equal empty string. Since that is also a constable like this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's reference. That's yeah. just compared yeah. to reference. Yeah. 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 Because empty string is an object as a super type. Yeah. But zero yeah. doesn't because it's an int. Yeah, so are, but, are, are, are you yeah. saying? If you cast it, 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 it yes. to your object, then it would work. But it's OK. Well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, no. It only can't be a primitive type. Right? So it's yeah. weird that it won't auto box it up, though, given the left hand side is an object dish. Yeah, that's true. It, yeah, that's interesting. Well, but if you did like uh, integer zero equals zero, double equals zero, does that auto box? Because mm. you have a capital I integer. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. if you were to just do <laughs> reverse those, so capital I integer equals double yeah, equals yeah, zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's interesting yeah, yeah. that it did. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I would say that's kind of weird. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, know constable, but I know these are terrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to know zero equals equals y. Oh, yeah, I just have to know. Know. Zero well, equals equals y. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy that that's least of the Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this would be extremely surprising. <laughs> it's not JavaScript. <laughs> yes. The Java doc has been lecturing us for two decades. What about to make them? Yeah. yeah. It has to be you know, reflexive and transitive. Okay, I'll find that. Well, that's, dot, that's dot equals. This, that, this is a reference comparison, anyways. 
That's true. Zero Wait, got, you you got equals y. What about three equal y? I don't know the answer to that. Zero got equals y. Works to be closer than that. No, no, that won't work. I have no idea what's in that. Oh. Yes. Okay, so crazy things happening here. All sorts of weird types passed by. <laughs> Interesting oh, question. That might work. Still no. no. Sorry, what was the question? It's still a primitive. Uh, zero, zero, zero L equals equals Y. Because it won't give you that error. It'll be object versus, it'll say long versus yeah. object instead of int. You might promote it. Do you want L or L? <laughs> Either one. Okay. But then equals equals. Yeah. Oh, well, equals equals. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can't yeah. dereference. Uh, oh, wow. Like this. And again, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's not as insane. A step. <laughs> yes. Wow. I've learned so much. <laughs> <laughs> Java hasn't caught up to C++ from 2002. Sad. Yeah. Okay, almost there. Final two questions. So we have crazy types here, right? Um, now, a question to ask, is, is this kind of thing is this feature specific to switch expressions or things that were added after a local variable type inference? Or could I emulate the same behavior with some older well-known constructs, right? In, in other words, if I rewrite this expression to like a reference conditional expression with a ternary operator, for example, do I get the same type? Will it even compile? So let's try that. I'm going to write this differently. I'm going to... Yeah. Okay. So this is a ternary operator, basically doing the same thing that our switch expression was doing. Sorry. Y equals zero. Yeah, it's it, it, it's an integer. Yes, we've we've actually we've seen that before. If I if I scroll far enough. Uh, where was that? Oh yeah, y equals integer zero. This thing here. Yeah. Okay. So how about this? First of all, who thinks this will compile and we get the same complex type that we got from the switch expression? Okay. Such a leading question. Who thinks this will compile? But we get a different type. <laughs> Who thinks this won't compile at all? <laughs> Fair. <laughs> if you want to change your vote, you can okay. now. <laughs> Who thinks there's a fourth choice? <laughs> <laughs> well, tautologically. <laughs> OK, so we got votes for all the choices. The first one, uh, which means consistently uh, complex type. Uh, was the winning choice. So let's try this out. This, of course, does compile, so that discards the final option. And we take a look at this. Yeah, it's exactly the same type. So this does work. And it's not a feature specific to switch expressions or anything like that. It's just uh, that's how it works. Well, it was fun, so you yeah. <laughs> so, so to map this to, to a more general principle, switch expressions, like conditional expressions based on the ternary operator, are poly expressions. Uh, so what that means, the, the way they behave, it essentially means that the type depends on the context, right? Uh, in practice, with switch expressions, it means that if the target type is known, it's propagated to each arm. If the target type is not known, which is what we had here, it's, it's computed as a combination of all the arms, right? And when I say combination, I mean it essentially applies capture conversion. So I interestingly enough, we're looking at the same rule that we've seen with capture variables, right? Do you remember what that rule was? It was about computing the, the sort of like the closest common supertype, right? So a, a, as a sanity check, if I change this to something like this, what would be the type of Y? That should be yeah. 
Yeah, so if we take a look at this, it's an integer, right? Because null type is a subtype of every reference type, including an integer. So the closest subtype is actually integer itself. And what would happen if I did this? <laughs> no, remember local variable type inference doesn't work with null. So <laughs> one of the very first examples that we had today. So, That, that's too complex. Let's not try that. <laughs> I just don't want to type. Yeah. has to go in the other direction for that question. Yeah. Can we check the medium type? We can try that later. Okay. Uh, let, let's just finish the quiz. Right, so One more question to go. Uh, so yeah, essentially, uh, so what we've seen here was we, we saw switch expressions and other conditionals. They were all poly expressions, and this is the kind of behavior that we get, right? Do we get the same behavior for all poly expressions? No, because lambdas and method references are also poly expressions, and we saw that it doesn't work there, right? So it's basically life is hard. That's the summary. <laughs> okay, final questions. While we're on the topic of switch expressions, um, I mentioned that this new syntax. Uh, works for both expressions and statements, right? So let's try to actually make it a statement. So let me find my switch from before. Where was that? Uh, okay, this is fine. Let me simplify this. Uh, let's just keep one branch here so that I don't have to type that much. And let's just make it a statement. So I'm just going to print out uh, my variable x. So this is now a statement, but we can still use the concise syntax, right? And you can see that this is a statement because it printed zero, but it has no return value, right? So the final question now is, if it, if it doesn't have any return value, what happens if I do this, if I try to assign it to a variable? Wait, I'm still stuck on that return. Yeah, where did the zero come from? Oh, it didn't return zero. Oh, it, yeah, it didn't return zero, but I'm printing x, and x is zero. So it's, it's, it's a printout as opposed to a return value. It was null, but I'm pretty sure it's null. Oh, uh, <laughs> so x is, x is left over from before. Yes. You, you've got to follow along from before. X <laughs> happened to be an integer that was zero. <laughs> yes. It's just, okay. X is zero, like Java Lang integer zero. Yes. yes. And we switched on it. No, this, this is a. This is now a statement, not an expression. Before we got the return type in the No, it's, 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 it's an expression because we have an arrow in the switch. It's no, it's a statement. What is the type of that? So the new, the new syntax can be, used, can be now used for both statements and expressions. And in this case, this is a statement. I, I don't have any return value. There's never a return. I'm just printing out. There's an implicit return in the... No, there isn't. Wait. It's void. It's a Wait, no. It, <laughs> it's a statement. statement. No, 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 no,
for this to have a return value. I could use the upper approach similar to lambdas. I could wrap this in a block, and I could just use the new yield here, uh, maybe something like this. And now you can see that we have a printout, but we also have a return value right below that, right? So that, th this is how it allows us to, to use statements but still keep a return value, very similar to lambdas. But yeah, this is why I'm running Java 13, essentially, because of this new yield statement that I wanted to show. If I was running Java 12, there would still be the old break statement. So in Java 12, break was extended to accept a value, and that would become the value of the enclosing switch expressions. In Java 13, we have a new keyword, which is now yield. Uh, I, I looked into this, why this suddenly changed, because I kind of liked the old approach. I thought it was you know, consistent between statements and expressions, and also kind of consistent with return. Uh, in how it behaves in methods. So I thought it was completely fine. But it, it turns out that they actually specifically wanted to distinguish these cases. So they wanted it to be like immediately visually obvious when switch is a statement and when switch is an expression. And that's why they introduced a new keyword. So that's a piece of trivia there. So that concludes our quiz. Now, I'm interested if, uh, first of all, how many of you even counted how many questions they got correctly? Based on the number. Okay. <laughs> Fair number. Uh, how many of you got more than 20? So 50% passing grade. Okay, pretty much everybody. Okay, how about more than, how about 30 or more? How many, how many in total? In total, 40. 40, yeah. 30 or more, okay, so we have what, like five, six people? 35 or more? Okay, how, how many did you get? 35 dead on. Okay, very cool. That's actually super impressive. So, beer well earned. Uh, <laughs> and a year of IntelliJ. And a year of IntelliJ. We're going to write to JetBrains and make sure it doesn't include the Scout ID. <laughs> 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 is the Scout ID free? Yeah, it is. That, they'll remove it just for me. Yeah, if you're using the license, it will not compile Scout ID. <laughs> Okay, so thanks everybody. Thanks for participating. Hope you found this fun. And yeah, if you have any examples to, to try, let's do it over a beer. <laughs> <laughs>